Well, actually, tonight I'd like to, to bring out my first big idea of, of the channel um, and tell you that I believe there is an alternative to the fast revolution, and that would be what I'm terming uh, stone soup socialism or a small and slow revolution. Um, and keen-eared listeners from previous streams will, will note that uh, small and slow revolution is a play on small and slow solutions from the permaculture principles. I think permaculture has a big part to play in all of this. Absolutely so. So, if we, instead of working out, you know, how the new power structure is going to be, we, we worry about sweeping aside all these powers and, and doing away with them permanently and putting down counter-revolutions, on and on and on and on. Instead of focusing on that, if we start small and focusing on how to meet the people's needs while at the same time collectively building power together, um, I think maybe we have a, a better chance of, of producing something permanent, something replicable, something that could spread from a small group of people outward, and something that focuses on the right thing, which is the results, it's the consequences of revolution, rather than the the, the titles and the circum, you know, the, all the, the pomp and circumstance of it, and, and you know, arguing about who's doing what and, and, and so forth. So, if we use the principles, starting with the principles of permaculture, focusing on earth care, people care, and redistributing the surplus to the the service of the first two, we can come up with uh, a very small um, but potentially long-term impactful uh, revolution, so to speak. And, and the way I propose it is to start with a stock pot, you know, just a large kitchen pot and a bunch of soup and uh, or stew or, or fresh ingredients, whatever you have in surplus um, or can get with, without putting yourself in a precarious position. Um, even if it's something you could get from, you know, what the local food producers throw out or would throw out. Um, whether that's, you know, through just going and talking to them and see if you can pick up stuff at the end of a shift or whether it's uh, dumpstering it yourself, you know, doing the, the gorilla um, route. But whatever it is, however you can get it, if you start with a stock pot and a means to cook it, um, I'd say that would be step one in this sort of uh, small and slow revolution. And from there, uh, you should select a public space where there's a lot of people. And this is where new urbanism comes into play a lot, because what I'm proposing is going to be a lot harder to do if you're in a very low density area. Uh, without a lot of public space, you say you're in the suburbs, you only have a handful of parks in the entire city. Um, you don't have a lot of traffic through those parks. Uh, you may have even tighter regulations in those parks. Um, and that's another part that new urbanism, or more specifically urban planning, comes into play. Look up your local regulations about how, when, and what the circumstances are for cooking food in a park. Um, if you're just having, I mean, there's virtually no parks uh, where people gather, especially in urban areas, where you can't at least have a barbecue, or there may be barbecue pits for people to use. Whatever, look around, see what's available to you, and and see what's the the best approach for not getting shut down. Basically, um, you don't have to put up signs for what you're doing. You don't have to make a big to do about it. Just go there, set up a pot, and a table, some paper bowls, some, some spoons, um, that sort of thing, and just start redistributing some of your uh, surplus, uh, in this case, in, in the form of food. And if you do this, you, you go and feed. It doesn't have to be, you know, some formal organized thing. It could just be you and, and someone to help you. It could, be, it could be as easy as starting with two people, one person to cook, one person to serve. You know, sort of avoiding cross-contamination as much as possible. Um, and I know this is difficult. Still, we're still in the time of COVID. Uh, people are, are wary about you know, food contamination and that sort of thing. But, you know, there's still restaurants that are, are doing curbside. And they manage to do that without sickening people all the time. So if you're wearing your protective gear, your, your 
gloves, your um, face masks at all times, and you're making sure to heat the, the food to uh, a, a safe level. I think it's 140 degrees. Don't quote me on that. Look these regulations. Look these these food, safe food handling regulations and uh, uh, measures up for yourself. But if you heat the food up, um, you're, you're making sure to clean everything before and after, and you're in the open air. Um, it's probably going to even be a safer way to, to distribute food than in a closed kitchen, taking it out to various people. So, so don't let that get you down. Um, and you know, it, in my, in my city, I know that there's been a lot of homeless camps that have propped up even over the winter. You, you see them again and again. And uh, I'm assuming it's the, the mayor is ordering the park workers to come in and just bulldoze them. I know there's one in Minneapolis recently, fairly large one that, that just got, you know, they, they tacked up little eviction notices to each of the tents and then they just bulldozed everything. And I don't know what happened to all those people. I don't know if they were, were helped into shelters. Uh, my thought is no, they're just kind of being pushed along, you know, swept under the rug, so to speak. Um, but that could be a place that you could start, start in a homeless camp. Uh, you know those people really need it. And this could be a way to, to start helping build community connections while, while getting them back on their feet. Okay, so you have your, your stock pot going. And after doing this week after week, month after month, just, just pick a day of the week, whatever day works best for you. Pick a, a, a general time that you know you can be there. Um, and then just week after week, if you keep coming and you keep coming, you're just naturally going to start build to, to build community connections. People will tell each other, you know, oh, hey, you know, they, they, this guy comes and serves food or, or these couple of people, they come by and they, they serve us food. Uh, every Friday or whatever, at, say six o'clock in this particular park or, or part of the city. Um, so turn up. I don't think it, I don't think it went into the means of heating it. Um, just as, as a technical note, I think my preference would be something like a, a propane burner. Um, if you look for a pro, propane stove, I think is what's, what's usually referred to. Just that you don't have to worry about any sort of wood ash or charcoal ash or having to deal with any of that. It's very clean. Uh, you know, it's a, a clean burning propane. Uh, that was a terrible way to kill it. I should be ashamed of myself. But anyway, uh, I, I think propane is probably going to be your best bet to have a reliable and, and clean source of, of fuel that you don't have to worry about disposing of. And that's going to build confidence in, you know, if there's local park patrols that don't like what you're doing. At least they'll know that you're not a danger to uh, leaning, leaving any sort of smoldering ashes or anything like that. So just something to consider. Well, that's one little side. Um, but I would say that uh, this should be something that you look at as, uh, I, won't, I don't want to say pure, but just something that you shouldn't have an agenda for necessarily. If you, if you build community connections and something comes of that, uh, you start meeting people that, that know people that, you know, you can maybe all get together and, and take it to the next step and, and form, say, a worker cooperative or something like that. It doesn't have to be based on, on food, but whatever it is your mutual interest is. That's great, but I would say try and keep this simple. Don't put too much uh, into it. Just make it be what it is, just a, a way to share the surplus, to give people basic necessities, to to do mutual aid because you think it's the right thing to do, to, to start, this, this is how community is built. You know, it's not through executive order or, or um, a mayor's decree or a new piece of legislation passing. These are the ways that community bonds really form. Um, if you live in an apartment, think of how many people you actually know in the apartment complex. I mean, I know a few. I, I know by name the people that live on my floor, except for one guy, um, and then a couple more people in my immediate building, but I don't know anyone in the other complex, you know? Look at this as an opportunity. Maybe you could do this right in your apartment complex, like on the lawn somewhere, as long as you don't involve the management company um, or get the permission if they're that kind of management company or if you actually have that space designated. Um, 
But just look at this as an opportunity to start building community. And then, you know, people are going to talk. People are going to start you know, getting to know each other, getting to trust each other. That's a big part of it. And eventually, things like politics are, are just naturally going to come up. Uh, and you might get to the point where you have enough people with just enough means that you could build some sort of cooperative. And in my case, uh, I think my ideal co uh, cooperative to start with uh, would be something like a cafe. And I'll tell you why. Uh, because of the principle of stacking functions. And that is something that's a permaculture concept um, where you have a bunch of elements that all serve one function and a bunch of functions served by each element. Um, and I think something like a cafe has a really good potential for stacking functions. Um, so I'm just going to pause the game for one second to show you about that. So uh, a couple of years ago, I, I wrote an article for a local urban planning blog called The Frosty Fish, a vision, a vision for the Future of Urban Farming. And in that, I lay out my vision for uh, all that one cafe could be. And it would include things like not just the, the food and the drink that's sold, but also it would have an aquaponics greenhouse uh, attached to it. For those unfamiliar, aquaponics is the merger of hydroponics, which is growing things in a liquid medium, and aquaculture, which is raising fish. And the, base, the very basic principle is you have a tank for the fish, the fish produce waste, that waste is then circulated through uh, what's called pebble beds that, that food's growing in. So there's never any contact between the water and the, and the food itself. It's very safe. You don't have to worry about any sort of uh, contamination of the actual edible parts of it. It's just going through the roots of the, the grow beds um, and that provides uh, fertilizer, in essence, for the plants, which grow better. And then those plants serve to filter the water for the fish. So you have this, you have the mimic, the, the very rudiments of uh, a functioning ecosystem happening here, where one system feeds into the other and it goes in a big cycle. So you can have that attached to a cafe. You grow a portion of your food hyper locally. You know, you, your mixed green salads or. Um, various herbs or spices, or things like that. Uh, and then also have a source of, of fish protein too, which uh, has always been very important for humanity. Fish has always been a staple food of pretty much every people's, um, except for ones I would assume that are in very deserted areas. But uh, so you can have that. That's another function that your cafe could, could house. You could also have um, radical literature. You have a little library that has stuff like the conquest of bread there so that people could start conversations about the, the sort of a future you want to see. And, you know, you, then you could have a meeting space where various organizations could form and, and have a place to, to start building new projects of their own. You, you act as like a beachhead, basically, for uh, more activism, for more cooperatives eventually to sprout from if you become profitable enough, you can use that money to, to uh, help fund more uh, cooperatives and, and, and so on and so on. Um, they would go on and form cooperatives and, and help, help fund cooperatives of another person, you know, and, and just keep on going, building this coalition of cooperatives um, to the point where you have a real uh, breeding ground for these ideas. A real way to disseminate this information um, and this theory, but also the practice of, of having a more democratic system. And when I say cooperative, I'm talking about worker-owned cooperatives, where you're still going to have, you know, a manager and a cash or cashier. If it's like a cafe, we're talking about again, uh, but that cashier has a say in working conditions, the hours, how they're distributed. Um, they're going to have a say in a democratic say. That means one vote, one person uh, for how much they're compensated, both in, in benefits and wages. Uh, they're going to have a say in if and how pensions are funded, 
on and on and on. Uh, it's, it's, it's more democracy and more freedom than the average worker has in their workplace right now. Think of the place that you work right now. How much of a say do you actually have? You don't. You, your boss has all the say, basically. It's an authoritarian, top-down system. Instead, what a worker cooperative is, is a more horizontally formed system of power uh, with more democracy and more freedom. So that's what we're talking about. So you build up this beachhead of, of cooperatives, like you like you, you, you say you start in a in a large city, whatever the largest city near you is, and and eventually you get to the point where there's a huge network of cooperatives. Well, then you can start branching out into the suburbs, and then once those get bit big and strong enough, you can branch out into the countryside, and that's where permaculture really comes in, because you can start funding uh, farming operations that produce not only food but fuel, fiber, fodder, which is animal feed. Uh, and pharmacy, um, as, as, as well as, as the food for people. And you can start taking away a lot of the power that, that these larger companies have over you. So think about it. If you had all your needs met, would you worry so much about, uh, you know, whether or not there's a Walmart in your town? Would you worry about... If, if the jobs of some large um, producer or some, some large business uh, got outsourced in one way or another, would you worry about automation? Would they be able to pull these levers over you and, and your city to get these tax breaks? Because, uh, you know, make no mistake, these large corporations like Target um, in, in the Twin Cities here, they get huge tax breaks just for locating their op their operations, you know, within the city limits of, say, Minneapolis. Um, and they, they negotiate that by saying, we're going to bring in all these jobs. Look at all these jobs we can bring in. And then the consequence of that, though, is they're not putting back into the tax system. So all that money is lost. All that money that could go to, to public programs is lost. So they have a huge lever that they can manipulate politics. Well, if instead... We had a lot of our needs met through our own networks. Um, they would have a much less of a say. Their their threats would mean much less. Uh, so this 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 idea of building a network of cooperatives is taking more and more of the power away from those that control your lives right now, and putting it in the hands of those who are looking to have a more egalitarian system, a more anarcho-communist system. Um, and then once you get to a certain point, like if, the, if this were to say, start out in one city and then go to another city and then a bunch of major cities adopted a program like this, um, uh, just going back to the, that, that first idea of starting with the, the stone soup, um, if, if, if a thousand people did it and then a hundred thousand people and a million people did it in all these different cities and over time got to the point where we were building up these cooperatives. Um, eventually we'd come to the point where there'd be a tipping point and these ideas of more democracy in everyday life, more fairness and freedom in everyday life would take over as being the, the social norm. And at that point, when everyone's basically used to the ideas of socialism, it wouldn't really be that big of a leap to just push through that, that leftward wall of, of capitalism and make for an actual uh, revolution. And it wouldn't even have to necessarily be an overthrow. It could just be a, a matter of course, really. Like people saying, yeah, you know, we've been living this way for generations now. Uh, it just makes sense. Let's, let's, let's do away with the old systems of exploitation and rebuild something new. So that's my idea for a small and slow revolution. And just one more note I want to say on that. Uh, the biggest challenge for sure, I, I would say, I would see as going from just doing the stone soup to making a, a, a viable cooperative. That's a lot of work. Uh, that's a lot of money and a lot of, that, that's when you're the most vulnerable and the most risky. Um, so don't be dismayed if you actually end up trying something like this and nothing more comes from it than 
just a bunch of neighbors getting together and, and talking about things. You're still successful then. And that's still something where, like, you know, as people naturally talk, something good could still come of it. Say uh, a bunch of renters have the same property management company or the same landlord, and they just through this get together and make that physical connection and say, oh, yeah, you know, he's, he doesn't do any snow removal. And, like, uh, my apartment got broken into, and they, they blame me, and, you know, they charge me huge uh, cleanup fees or something. Else, whatever it is. You can talk about the issues you're having, about pest control. And that's something that, that I'm sure a lot of, of urban dwellers are familiar with, is, is the, just the difficulty in getting any sort of property management company or landlord to do anything about the pest and having them, you know, start by trying to blame their tenants when, you know, you keep, you keep a clean home and, and there's, there's, or you live way up on the, the third or fourth floor or whatever it is, there's no way that you could be attracting in any sort of pest. But, but there it is, them trying to squeeze every dollar out of you. But if you got together and talked with other people, you could organize a renter strike or you could uh, organize a, a, a tenant's uh, union. There's, there's any number of, of, of organizations that could come out. This doesn't just have to be cooperatives. So so, so circling it back again, if, if you try something like this and only a couple of people show up the first time and maybe a handful of people stay from you know, month to month or week to week, you're still successful. You're still doing the good work of building community. So that alone, I think, makes it worth trying something like this. Just trying that basic, trying to do that basic building block of community. And that, 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 that covers all the different theories that I talk about. That's, that's the, the mutual aid of anarcho-communism. That is the, the facilitating of community and building of community bonds of new urbanism. That is the, the sharing of surplus, the, the people care and the earth care of, of permaculture. It all comes together in something really simple, but something that can be very, very powerful. And that's, that's uh, stone soup socialism, a small and slow revolution.